so I'm going to be talking about um, operating uh, robots on Mars. And so these are the landing sites of all the successful missions on the surface of Mars. And it also shows uh, the planned Perseverance uh, landing site. And I'm gonna be talking about robotic operations uh, using examples uh, from some of the missions I've been part of, uh, which are highlighted here. So th these pictures uh, were taken in the JPL Mars yard and they show full scale test beds for all our Mars rovers. So at the bottom there is Sojourner and uh, the MER test bed for Spirit and Opportunity is on the far left and Curiosity is in the middle and Perseverance uh, is on the right. Uh, there's also a full artist's rendering that I'm showing here at the bottom for uh, the Perseverance because the VSTB doesn't yet have the robotic arm, uh, the sampling ACA adaptive caching assembly, and it doesn't show the Mars helicopter, which is mounted under the belly of the rover. So rover planners um, specialize in three main uh, domains. Uh, it's driving uh, the rover, operating the robotic arm, and uh, sampling. And I'll talk about each of these a uh, little bit more. Uh, so once uh, we have entry, descent, and landing, the sky crane will drop the rover somewhere within the landing ellipse. And here I'm showing uh, the Perseverance one at Jezero Crater. And rover driving starts from wherever that position might be. Um, we run um, thousands of simulations and plan traverses uh, from various categories of starting positions so that we can hit the ground running. Here you're seeing examples, uh, you know, there's hundreds of them, but uh, the one and the ones are showing a few options that are on the Delta. The twos are showing options that are just off the Delta and then the threes are in the remnants. On Perseverance, uh, we also have the helicopter uh, that will deploy uh, from under the rover. Um, and there's some interesting interactions there with uh, the rover operations. Um, but Bob Balaram, who's the chief engineer of the helicopter, uh, is also talking at the convention and he'll probably go into that in more detail. So I wanted to start with talking about some of the different types of driving. So there's three main types of drives that we do and they require a different approach to driving. The first main one is like a traverse. Um, our goal when we're doing a traverse is to get some distance. We're trying to get to some specific destination that's of scientific interest. Um, here I'm showing an example actually from Opportunity, which is, an, um, this is an example from Meridiani. And we started this track at Victoria Crater and the image on the top left shows um, an orbital image of Opportunity actually at the rim of uh, Victoria, it was taken from orbit. And then, uh, you know, there are a couple of other images here I have uh, that I'm personally really fond of. The one below that shows the day we climbed out of Victoria. And then at the bottom right, you're seeing the image that is on the, um, uh, that is when we reached Endeavour, uh, it was taken at uh, the Greeley Panorama and was taken uh, around Cape York. And this trek is one of the longer treks. It took like four years to do. Many of the rover drivers have a copy of that Greeley Panorama because we were moving to Curiosity for Mars time. Um, and so when we're doing these long drives, the goal is to get to the destination, but we'll often make detours along the way uh, to study interesting features. And I put up pictures of some of my favorite ones. On the top right uh, is an image of Santa Maria Crater. And at the bottom left uh, is a image of a block island, which was like a meteorite that we found uh, along the route. When we're doing these long traverses, we also often uh, use the autonomous self-driving capabilities. It allows us to drive um, and cover further distance and beyond which we can see uh, with images that we have available on the ground. Although we're doing the autonomous driving, we, we designed these because of the variety of terrain we encounter to be very tunable and to avoid the drive ending in a fault or to avoid taking undue risk, rover drivers actually play a significant role even when we're doing autonomous drive in order to specify some of these constraints. And the next category, the second category, main category of the types of uh, driving we do is what we call a walkabout. Uh, we are interested in performing some detailed investigation in a region of interest uh, to do some science characterization. And here I'm showing an example from Pahrump. 
And depending on the goals of the mission, the terminology might vary, but the main goal is that we're trying to uh, find what the best area is here to do the specific observation. So we'll do um, the first pass, which where we're just counting out the area and it includes imaging with our science uh, instruments, the remote instruments, which is cameras mounted on the mast, or we might shoot the laser uh, to study the chemistry. And I'm showing you a picture on the bottom right of the kind of characterization we might do in this first pass. And then we return to do a second pass uh, to the higher priority targets. And then we do relatively more expensive uh, observations, uh, such as contact signs, where we actually have to deploy the arm and study the targets. Uh, here I'm showing an example in the bottom middle of a brushing we performed there. Uh, and sometimes it revealed surprises. Uh, in this case, we saw these lenticular features at the Mojave target. Um, and Mars is a really dusty place. Um, we came back to this in another pass and it had already been covered up with dust. Um, and the final pass, we picked one or two areas where we're actually going to do a lot of investigation. In this particular case, we might uh, drill. And here I'm showing an example from Param where there's a number of sample related activities uh, that are tightly coupled um, that we would do at that specific location. And then another major, the last category I'm gonna talk about is what we call a precision approach. And here we're trying to position the rover so that we get to this position, we can deploy the robotic arm and instruments on the targets of interest. Um, the constraints we have when we're doing an approach vary a lot, depending on what we want to do. Uh, sometimes, you know, I'm showing a picture on the top right, which is a picture we took at Bagnold, where we were doing a scooping campaign. Um, there, we had to reconcile competing kinematic, wind, lighting, and uh, communications constraints. Uh, for the tilt and heading for the time of day. We also have all of the classic robotic arm kinematic constraints. Uh, we have a five degree of freedom robotic arm. It has five joints and there are kinematic constraints on what we can reach uh, from a given position. Uh, different parking positions change uh, what we can reach. I mean, certainly at the gross scale, but just repositioning a couple of centimeters, we often do that and it's called a bump. Uh, or even doing a slight turn can resolve some of the arm kinematic constraints. And this allows us to position instruments on a target uh, that we might not have been able to. But when we want to perform a lot of different correlated observations, we can't reposition between them. And so prior to approaching, you have to take all of those into account and ensure you can do all of them from that position. And that's what makes a precision approach interesting is because you're using the rover and the degrees of freedom of the robotic arm to manage all of these constraints. Uh, so in terms of driving, uh, we always have a strategic route for the mission. And here I'm showing a really simplified version. It's one that's developed in conjunction with scientists and uh, robot planners uh, to determine strategically sort of in the group what, where, where we are going. Um, and before we land, we have a dozens of paths we have all awaiting, you know, hundreds of them. And, but once we landed, there is one specific point, and here for curiosity, that was a Bradbury landing shown as a star. And then every Sol, um, which is a Martian day, uh, we get engineering and science data from the rover. And that data goes through a series of automated processing. And then the information is presented to experts. Um, our other um, uh, team members, uh, you know, evaluate this and they'll go into, you know, the science team members who are talking at this convention will probably go into some of the more details into all of that that goes into the science team deciding what to do next on the next SOL. The result is that we get a set of activities for that SOL and automated tools uh, manage constraints, you know, such as thermal, energy, calm. But all along, rover drivers are also evaluating the drive paths. And depending on whether we're doing a long distance drive, whether we're doing a traverse or precision approach, uh, the path would vary. And, you know, I'm not gonna show all of those here, but we have some pretty neat uh, robo driving tools uh, that have, we've uh, developed uh, from experience all the way going back to Sojourner and we've enhanced them 
uh, and we've been using daily since 2004 with the MER rovers. Um, and I'm showing, you know, we always look at the data in 3D with our goggles. And then at the top there, uh, middle, I'm showing an image uh, where we have an overlay in the color where we may sometimes just have a monocular image. It allows us to look at a lot of the terrain further out in detail, but we are always aware of whether uh, we actually have stereo data. The gray overlays here are images taken with our navigation cameras, which actually have 3D data. They have stereo information uh, where we can uh, measure range and uh, evaluate um, the size uh, of obstacles. And in the middle, I'm actually showing 3D points, which are um, uh, the mesh that we drive on. As you can see, there's often a lot of poles in it. Partly it's because of a view shed or occlusion. So you can't, from the viewpoint, even though the rover has a pretty tall mass, you can't see behind certain obstacles. And that you need to factor in uh, when you're planning your drive. And um, depending on the terrain, um, we may get really dense or we get uh, somewhat sparse stereo. And that is, uh, you know, some of the factors that we consider in uh, when we are driving. Um, and then the image at the bottom, I'm showing a classic dog leg that we do to get around a terrain artifact that may look very benign in 2D, but once you look in 3D, uh, uh, you may determine that it is something that we want to go around. And then in terms of the robotic arm, uh, something we do regularly is contact science. Uh, it's about positioning the instruments and tools that are on the turret at the end of the robotic arm and uh, close to the surface. Um, it's only safe to make actual contact with the surface with the limited hardware on the arm uh, that's actually designed for contact sensing. With, we don't wanna touch uh, any of the other hardware. But we're still trying to position this uh, two and a half, a 2.1 meter, 100 kilogram arm in really close proximity uh, to the surface. And the terrain interactions get interesting. They require trade-offs with close positioning uh, where we can you know, adjust the angle at which we approach um, to avoid obstacles or for lighting constraints. So that's a lot of what goes on into uh, robo planning for these close observations. And here I'm showing an example, which I'd shown before at Pahrump, uh, and here, it's just the drilling related activities, but we needed to ensure that we met all the constraints, not just for the drill locations where the drill prongs would go, where the drill bit would go, but also for the mini drill, uh, where we drill just enough to quickly observe the results before ingesting the sample. Uh, we also need to have an area in the workspace and the kinematic reachability where we will um, dump the sample uh, after drilling, so we can place the arm-mounted instruments such as the spectrometer or the Molly hand lens imager to study this material. And the material that we have, uh, you know, after we've sieved has different particle sizes than the material that's left behind. And those are all have scientific interest. And so we put them in different piles so that we can then place instruments and study them. And we have a lot of specific robotic operations tools that help evaluate all of this quantitatively but it's the rover planners that make the trade-offs when you need to relax margins and when it's appropriate to do that. And I'll say that in my personal experience when I'm training rover planners, the combination of these technical, the technical knowledge and of these constraints and the art that it takes in selecting these targets, that's one of the hardest, um, that's one of the thing that really takes the longest uh, to learn. And here is a video, and we'll see how the video does over Zoom. Uh, but this is a video that shows uh, the very first and go we did with Curiosity, uh, which involves, uh, this is Rock Nest 3, a rock where we retract the arm from Rock Nest 3. And here we actually had cache sample. We're caching it. We are imaging, um, then we stow uh, the mast, uh, but then we started driving. And the rover can drive backwards or forward, whatever is optimal and you'll see the mass move because we're taking images of a visual odometry, which I'll talk about later uh, as we continue on uh, along uh, the drive. And uh, the other major uh, aspect of robot planning is sampling. And uh, the Curiosity sort of has a percussive drill that collects powderized sample that we deliver to the instruments. Uh, and they, this involves like hours of movement uh, that process and deliver samples to instruments uh, that uh, in the rover body by inlets. Um, on perseverance, um, the sampling is relatively decoupled. Uh, here we're collecting sample cores 
uh, and we're going to bring them back to Earth with the subsequent mission. Uh, but after drilling, the robotic arm docks with the adaptive caching assembly. And there's a second robotic arm, the SHA, the sample handling arm that we have. Uh, and that moves the tube uh, through you know, volume assessment, imaging, and sealing uh, to storage. Uh, and we have, uh, you know, I've provided a link there because there's a lot of detail in the videos uh, if you're interested in checking those out. This is another example where I show drill targeting. Often when we're doing really precision targeting, we're talking about a uh, robotic arm uh, that, that is, uh, has uh, sort of uh, all kinds of uncertainties, both from uh, imaging, there's uncertainty from the backlash, from thermal constraints, and so the end-to-end -end accuracy of the robotic arm is actually like two and a half centimeters, but the repeatability is really good. We get millimeter level accuracy. So sometimes, this on the left, I'm showing an image where we brush the target and we want to drill. We'll take a picture with a molly and we'll look at where the drill prongs ended up. And then we'll do a little nudge and make an adjustment. So we precisely end up drilling where we want to. This kind of thing takes an earth in the loop cycle. So on perseverance, here I'm actually showing uh, the robotic uh, tools for curiosity, but the technology is actually something uh, we've implemented on, that I was involved with implementing on uh, Perseverance, where we are going to, at the end of a drive, take the image of the workplace, autonomously build a terrain model, determine where the terrain uh, would collide with rover hardware, deploy the robotic arm, and take an image with the imager at the end of the arm. And this then allows us to get rid of that cycle and be uh, uh, you know, more precise in how we position instruments, especially the uh, Pixel and Sherlock instruments require fairly precise um, positioning. And so this is gonna be very helpful. This is new capability that we have on Perseverance. So there are a number of different aspects of robotic operations and I thought I'd give a few Mars examples. So this first one is from Dingo Gab. So uh, we decided to intentionally cross a dune of sand with curiosity. And uh, the reason is that our wheels had been experiencing some wheel wear and we wanted to take a route that avoided the terrain with these sharper artifacts. Um, the reason we were comfortable crossing Dingo Gap is that previously we had experience from opportunity. And as many of you uh, probably know, opportunity spent 50 meters of a 90 meter drive digging itself in to this area, which would become known as purgatory. Uh, we extricated ourselves and uh, as we always do, we developed a new strategy for avoiding such situations. Um, where we uh, complement the position estimation that we get from our wheel odometry and from the IMU and accelerometer data with visual feedback. So visual odometry takes a picture uh, before and after motion and then uh, autonomously on board, we check whether the motion is within expected bounds. And uh, based on that, we can take, do a variety of different things. Dr. Berman, you have five minutes remaining. Okay, so our driving tools also enable modeling tracks with the different slip. And here uh, I'm showing uh, how we did visual odometry in the bottom left, actually crossing over Dingo Gap. And then the image of the right is taken once we crossed into Dingo Gap into better terrain into Moonlight Valley. And this is an image, uh, you know, that is another example that was from one of the end of one of my drives where in this mission, we hadn't actually, this was the first time we were doing polygonal ripples and we used VO as a safeguard. And in this case, it did protect us. And that was very useful. So Curiosity has a 133 megahertz processor and it has a backup computer. Uh, but on Perseverance, we actually have a second computer and we had an FPGA that's dedicated to image processing. So now, we can, uh, you know, the visual odometry that would take 30 seconds in perseverance takes just seconds and we'll expect to do it by default all the time. And the dedicated computer also makes autonomous driving uh, a lot faster. So we can cover 500 meters over three salts without earth on the loop. So perseverance is going to be able to drive a lot faster autonomously. And we've also improved the wheels, uh, you know, on the right of perseverance wheels, which are thicker and have a different ground zero pattern. Uh, so we don't expect to have some of the same real world concerns. Here I'm briefly going to talk about another example, which is of cache sample. So the hardware we had on Curiosity, the architecture was simple, which was we do a serial change. We'd acquire a sample, process it, deliver it, and then clean it out. But we couldn't store the arm or do contact science with sample in the system. But very early in the mission, the science team found 
that they really wanted to do a series of experiments over time with that sample. And they wanted uh, to be able to uh, still continue driving. So we came up with an approach that enabled us to do sampling uh, with uh, using the hardware to cache various caches and cachements uh, at different orientations. But there was a risk of clogging the SIP. And here, this is a complicated picture, but what it's showing is that we identified a cache for every orientation of the turret with respect to gravity to mitigate this risk. And uh, we designed the system to extend the, uh, we had already anticipated this and we designed the system so we could extend the architecture and we didn't have to change the onboard flight software. We were able to very quickly adapt the rover driving tools uh, to implement these constraints. Uh, and the most exciting sample, one of the most exciting samples, Cumberland, it was in Chimera for over um, eight months. And we spent until the drill hardware started uh, having problems. Um, half the mission, most of the half the contact science was done with sample in the system. So this is an example of anticipating that you're always, Mars is going to surprise you and you need to design the system for evolution. And then this example is another one, I like guess, from Maria's Pass. Um, our science team was interested in studying the contact between the Stimson and Murray formation, and which had really high science value. So we climbed uh, over the slope, and this is sort of the vantage point we had. Uh, we were also getting really close to Mars solar conjunction, when the sun gets between Earth and Mars, and it interferes with our communication. So we really wanted to make it across so we could get to that um, contact, and we did. And on the top right, I'm showing an image from Zola. But during conjunction, uh, as we were getting data down, this very uh, you know, mundane looking rock, Elk, when we looked at the data that we got down from it, uh, which is on the right, I'm showing an image from our ChemCam instrument, which takes a really high resolution, uh, 20 um, uh, micron image, uh, we were able to detect that this was the highest silica that we had seen on this site. The, the rover collects so much data, we weren't able to get it in time. So we actually went back to that region and found an area that we wanted to drill, which became a buckskin. Uh, in order to um, uh, address this perseverance, we have uh, artificial intelligence on board with Aegis, where scientists can specify targets of interest. and. Without ground in the loop, we can determine what's interesting. And here the green shows the top target and can zap it with the laser. So now we can, before we drive away from the location, get data that tells us if you want to do further investigation. And uh, this is also a plank on Curiosity. And here we're showing some of the results from Curiosity. So I'm only going to talk about one more thing here. Uh, and actually it's uh, interesting that, uh, you know, th that was probably one of the last things I was going to go into. Um, uh, but uh, so that, to leave time for some questions, if you have any questions. Yeah, um, thank you, Dr. Verma. Uh, let's see, we have a few questions here. Mm -hmm. uh, so Kareem here. asks, uh, why don't you want any of the other hardware to touch the surface? Um, so the hardware isn't designed to touch the surface. And, you know, so for example, we have um, the Mali camera, which has a very delicate lens on it. And we wouldn't want that to contact the surface because that would impact um, uh, the capability of the hardware to continue making observations. Or say the APXS, which has a very sensitive detector. So a lot of the instruments we have at the end of the arm, they have very sensitive um, detectors because, and that's part of what they're able to do the science. Uh, the robotic arm hardware isn't designed sort of with bumpers. Um, uh, you know, we care about the weight we send to Mars. and so. Uh, we only make contact with hardware that is designed to contact it because the rest of it um, may not be able to operate nominally after making that contact. Thank you. Uh, Aurelian asks, how do you train for driving the rover using a real one on Earth or using a rover simulator? If so, did NASA develop a rover simulator? That's a really good question. So um, we actually have a number of different simulators of different fidelity. We have simulators um, that are just software sims. We have simulators that have the actual avionics, the real RAD 750 computer. And then we have the full vehicle system test bed. Uh, to train driver drivers, uh, we actually first have, you know, like just classroom teaching and uh, go through uh, can sample scenarios that rover drivers might do. But really, the biggest amount of training really comes from hands-on driving while shadowing somebody who has, is previously certified with the driving. So 
it takes um, quite a long time, a number of years, uh, to get a rover driver certified in all the different categories. But over time, sort of we optimize the ways because we have a number of um, simulators in which they can offline uh, practice um, these approaches. That's very interesting. Does that go on your driver's license? <laughs> you know, actually, it's interesting. During Mars time, they did give us Martian driver's licenses. Uh, and, you know, it's, it's not just about the driving. It's really about doing it within the time constraints you have and in conjunction with the science teams and managing all of that. So why you really have to be in the actual setting is those things uh, are really important uh, to work out because the uplink to Mars is happening at a certain time. And by then, uh, you know, you don't just send a drive to Mars if you think it's good enough. You really have to be sure that uh, it's safe. You may not know exactly where the rover is going to end up if it's an autonomous drive, but uh, you know, you're certain by that time that you have verified everything you need to. So it's, it's, that, it's, it's doing that on, under the time constraints that is also really interesting. Uh, that leads right into Orion's question. He asks, can you talk about the balance between autonomy against manual control, for example, the overall global path versus the daily drive? That's a really good question. So the, there's a multiple aspects of that question. So there's a, the part about the global path and the local drive. So global path is giving a direction of where we are going. And there are waypoints that are the regions of interest that we really want to get to. But really every day you are making a decision as to what's the best round in this local terrain based on the data you have. At times you may actually end up driving in the opposite direction to get around something and that's perfectly fine. So that Strategic route is the general direction, but the local driving is very much based on what's appropriate given the terrain. Now, in terms of the autonomous driving, that's another thing I didn't go into too much detail here, but because the computational constraints, autonomous driving uh, takes a lot more computation. In addition, the rover is doing the thinking and it'll have its own ideas. Now, of course, these are predictable and we've encoded those, but humans based on other constraints when we are picking a path might pick a more direct route based on the current specific constraints so we always do blind drives as we call them which is we get a picture and we can drive in an area we can see and then we'll autonomously use the visual odometry which will check and then if the rover didn't make enough progress we'll do another step so that's a good way for us to without earth in the loop to actually get the distance because we're using that. That's one way. And then the other way is where we just let the rover image the terrain, find the hazards, work its way around it. So all of those are modes you deploy based on where you're trying to get to, what the terrain looks like, and what your time available is. Excellent. Thank you, uh, Dr. Verma. That's all the time we have for questions right now. And uh, we'd like to thank Dr. Verma for her presentation. Thank you. Bye-bye.